Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Michelle Easton, president of the Claire Booth Luce Policy Institute, and I want to thank you all for joining us here at our Conservative Women's Network. Special thanks to our CWN co-hosts, uh, represented by Bridget Wagner, the Heritage Foundation. We've been partnering in these events now for over 15 years. And we're delighted to have Cleta Mitchell with us today as our September speaker. Cleta is a partner in the Washington, D.C. office of Foley and Lardner. With more than 40 years of experience in law, politics, and public policy, she's one of America's preeminent experts on campaign finance and political tax law, among other topics. <laughs> As many of you know, Cleta is the attorney responsible for exposing Obama's IRS scandal and persuading members of Congress that conservative groups were facing abuse and harassment by this powerful government agency. She's still fighting to uncover the truth about this extraordinary abuse of power, and we're lucky to have us with us today to give us a first-hand update on the investigation. Cleta represents numerous candidates, campaigns, and members of Congress. She served as legal counsel to the National Republican Senatorial Committee and the National Republican Congressional Committee. And she's testified before Congress on numerous occasions, a frequent speaker and guest commentator on political law. I like to watch on Fox, too. <laughs> Previously, she served as a member of the Oklahoma House of Representatives, where she chaired the House Appropriations and Budget Committee there in Oklahoma. She's also a frequent speaker for the Claire Booth Luce Policy Institute, and last year was presented with our 2013 Woman of the Year Award. She received her BA and JD from the University of Oklahoma and is admitted to practice in the District of Columbia, the State of Oklahoma, the Supreme Court of the United States, and Federal and District Appellate Courts. She's married to Dale Mitchell, such a cutie, <laughs> former professional ball player. That's right. And they have a grown daughter who's a successful corporate professional living in Australia. And I know that Cleet is thrilled that her daughter is returning home in just a few weeks to get married. Please join me in welcoming Cleta Mitchell. I, I love this woman. <laughs> yes, and if I look a little shell-shocked, I just got some invoices for the wedding flowers and things like that this morning. So, you know, we, we, were, we thought we'd had that done. But anyway, so I could spend the next four hours talking to you about the IRS and the IRS scandal. And I don't want to do that, uh, mainly because um, you have lives to leave. And I want to give you, what I'd like to do is try my best to keep the, my comments to a minimum and then let you ask questions. Sort of this is everything you wanted to know, but you didn't know who to ask. Mm -hmm. And I would be happy to talk to you about it. Let me just give you a little brief overview about some of my role. I mean, what, how did a nice girl like me end up fighting with the IRS? My husband says he's got to quit playing golf with me because he knows that the IRS is going to drone us on the golf course. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, what I do in my day job is people come to me and they say they want to do something in the political or policy world. And it's a highly regulated business. I mean, I do the business and regulation of politics and policy. That's what I do. So people say, this is what we want to do. And then I figure out, OK, what's the best structure? What's the best framework? If you're going to open a bank account, you got to tell the IRS what it is you are. I mean, if any of us open a bank account, we give them our Social Security number. If you want to open a bank account, but it, it, it's for an entity that is not a live human being, well, it's, a, it's an entity, and you have to tell the IRS what kind of entity it is so you can get an employer ID number and open a bank account. I mean, that's how it works in the, in the world of legal commerce. I don't know how it works in the black market, and I don't want to know. But that's what people who are trying to follow the law do. So, you know, I will figure out what kind is the best entity for an organization uh, or a group of people who want to form something. And that has historically meant applying then to the IRS for exempt status for uh, different types of, of exempt organizations. And an exempt organiza a tax exempt organization means that the organization does not have to pay income taxes on its contributions. Um, it has to pay other kinds of taxes, heritage or Claire Booth Luce, I mean, you pay other kinds of taxes, payroll taxes, other kinds of things if you own property, but you don't have to pay income taxes on the contributions that you receive. 
That's all it means. I've listened to some of these morons in Congress, these Democrats talking about, you know, at these, some of these hearings, and you just think, I can't, you know, just be quiet. You're just dis exposing your stupidity <laughs> and complete lack of understanding of the law. Um, so a 501c4 organization is considered as a social welfare organization. It's, a, it's kind of a catch-all. It's the miscellaneous bucket of types of entities for exempt organizations. And um, it's allowed to spend 100% of its resources and all uh, lobbying and all, and it can spend part of its money on political activities. It just can't spend most of its money on political activities. Anyway, that's been the law forever, and it's been since 1959. And, um, you know, normally applying for a C4 status would take three to four weeks. Send in your, you know, there's a form, it's on the website, you fill it out, you send it in, and uh, you tell the IRS the certain or information that the IRS has published that it says it wants, and you provide that, and like I say, historically it has taken three to four weeks. You know, I went back and looked when this whole thing broke, I had 30 days, two weeks, three weeks, not long, because contributions to a 501c4 organization are not deductible to the donor. You give money to the Heritage Foundation or Claire Booth Luce, these are 501c3 charitable educational organizations that can do nothing politically, no political, of course, unless you're a liberal organization and you get away with doing whatever the heck you want, <laughs> uh, truly, um, and you can and engage in a, a small amount of lobbying, but mainly educational. And if I give money to the Heritage Foundation or to Claire Booth Luce, I get a tax deduction as a charitable contribution. That's not true with a 501c4. So um, I filled out in fall of 2009, October 2009, I filed an application for C4 status for a group that wanted to form to fight Obamacare. You want to think back? Obamacare. And I will always believe, let me tell you something, I will always believe that one of the reasons that this whole thing happened was because suddenly there are all these organizations arising out of, you know, angst among American citizens to fight Obamacare. Because if you think about what was happening in the late fall of 2009 and early 2010, that's what people were talking about, that's what they were concerned about. And so I applied for C4 status for a group October 2009, plain vanilla, lobbying, they never did any political activity. They cashed our check because you pay money to apply for the IRS to um, review your application. Never heard, didn't hear anything from the IRS. November, December, January, February, not until June of 2010 did I hear from the IRS about this organization and its application. And when I heard from the IRS, it was not from Cincinnati, which is where all the tax exempt applications supposedly go. It was from the Washington, D.C. office. Mm -hmm. And what did they want? They wanted something I'd never been asked for before. Before, if I'd ever had any follow-up questions, it would be, you only have one board member, or what are the qualifications of your board members, um, or your articles of incorporation don't say what they're supposed to say. Or Anyway, it would always be about something that was in the application published by the IRS and posted on its website, and it, some part of that. This organization was asked to provide all of the ads that it had run against Obamacare. And that wasn't an easy thing to do because the IRS, the guy from the IRS kept telling me that, well, I, I can't remember if it's we had to do a thumb drive or we couldn't, I think we could not give them a thumb drive. I had to go find, I mean, that was not an easy thing to do. I had to go find the uh, media producer. I mean, they literally did raise money and then they ran ads in different congressional districts saying so-and-so, you know, here's one bad thing about Obamacare, call representative so-and-so. It was classic lobbying, grassroots lobbying. It was not political. There was no political activity by this organization. So that was really an odd thing to me. Fast forward with that organization, I will tell you, I didn't hear from them after I submitted that. Then following June, so now we're in 2011, I write a letter saying, you know, here's the timeline. Here's all this organization has done. I'm beginning to think the only reason you haven't processed and granted this application is because of their fight against the government takeover of our health care system. I think that you are making a political decision. And I, if you're going to deny it, just go ahead and deny it, and we'll start the necessary appeals. 
Well, the next day I have three IRS agents from Washington all on the phone calling me saying, oh, no, 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 no. And, I mean, this went on for years. They finally got their C-4 status in July of 2013, something that should have taken three weeks maximum. Now, meanwhile, I have other organizations that are starting to apply for things. I mean, this is a normal course of business. Nothing's happening with any of them. And, um, you know, and, and so I had written the IRS, we had supplemented, we had talked to the IRS in Cincinnati about some of them. And finally, this is going on for a year now, two years. Finally, in February of 2011, a number of my clients, and then I find hundreds of organizations across the country have received these long questionnaires from the IRS asking them questions like, did you have any, uh, did you have any uh, elected officials or candidates speak to your organization? If so, who were they? Please provide a transcript of their remarks. Now, think about that. You go to a, a local citizens group and somebody comes in for running for county judge, whatever, you're supposed to have a transcript? Well, we, they wanted the, the uh, you know, everything about all the officers and board members. Have any of them run for office? Are any, are, do you have any, are, they, are any of them running for office now? Do they have any plans to run for office in the future? Some were asked for, some groups were asked for their donor list, and we've read about that since then. I mean, I called the IRS office and said, you're asking me for donor lists? I said, you realize that when and if you ever get around to granting this organization's tax exempt status, everything in this file is supposed to be made public. I said, this is not a public filing, the donor list. Donors are disclosed to the IRS on the 990, but that's not a public filing. So you're asking me for something that's going to be made public? You don't have a right to ask me for that. And then there was this, I got these one fax saying, okay, well, reduce the amount that, or raise the amount, only give us donors over such and such. And then I get another call, disregard that fax, we, you don't have to answer that question. I mean, and this was from the Washington office, I'm telling you, this was not from uh, the Cincinnati office. I had other dealings with the Cincinnati office. But when I saw these questionnaires, I'd never seen anything like this. When I saw those questionnaires, what I immediately did was go through and redacted the identifying information so you couldn't tell who sent it or who received it, but it left all the other information. And I started banging on the doors of the staff people on the House Ways and Means Committee and the Senate Finance Committee and saying, guys, something is going on at the IRS. I've known it. This proves it. Something is going on. I've never seen anything like this before. Now, remember, in March then of 2012, Congressman Jordan and Congressman Issa held a hearing of House Oversight, and they had then uh, the commissioner, the acting commissioner, Stephen Miller, uh, who came in. Well, actually, no, this was before Stephen Miller became acting. This was Doug Shulman who came in and testified, and they said, is there targeting of conservative organizations? He said, there is not. There is no targeting. And, well, why are they getting all these letters? You don't have to submit an application for C, this is what he said, you don't have to submit an application for C4 status to operate as a C4, which is true, which is now my new rule for all clients. We ain't, we ain't going back to those people. Um, <laughs> he said, but once you submit an application, we can ask you anything we want. Well, that's an interesting interpretation of the rule of law. Mm -hmm. um, but I will tell you, I did learn uh, an interesting story about how it was that the TIGTA investigation, what happened was, uh, how, how that came about in uh, 2011. And that is that, um, it was March of 2011 when, uh, or maybe I can't remember when Doug Shulman testified. He testified in March of 2011. And then fast forward, uh, Steve Miller lied also. But, um, they had a meeting we have, because people started sending these letters to Jim Jordan, who, as many of you may know, I mean, he's a wonderful conservative. He's been head of the RSC, and so we all love Jim Jordan. And so you feel like he, yeah, he really cares about conservative organizations. And so a number of groups in Ohio went to see him and took him copies of these letters. So he has his staff call Lois Lerner to come for a meeting. And I was... I went to speak to the Capitol Hill Federalist Society just a few months ago, and I was seated next to a young woman that I had known when she worked for another congresswoman. I hadn't seen her in a long time. And I said, oh, you, I remember you. You were going to law school. She said, well, yes, I went to law school, and I got out of law school, and then I went to work for the Oversight Committee. And she said, I was assigned to get Lois Lerner to come over and meet with us to talk about these 
letters. They call them development letters. And she said, so Lois Lerner comes over with a couple of her henchmen, and she said, this young woman told me, the staffer said, Lois Lerner was so arrogant and so obnoxious. And so why are you asking me this? We can do whatever we want. They file these, whatever, we, you know, just completely stonewalled. You know, you don't have any right to ask me anything. And so after the meeting, she said that the staffer, the other staffer with her, that they kind of looked at each other and said, well, that was interesting. Now what do we do? We can't go back and tell our bosses, Isa and Jordan, well, she just stonewalled us. So they said, so she said, what else can we do? And so she said, well, how about asking for an inspector general's investigation? Like, oh, that's a good idea. So they go back and make a recommendation, and Isa and Jordan asked for the inspector general's investigation, the TIGTA investigation, which um, now then, of course, um, the rest is history, where they found that indeed that um, they had, uh, that the, there was targeting, and there's no question there's targeting. I've seen all the, if you, the documents posted on the House Ways and Means Democrats have posted these documents, which just basically tell the whole story. But the point is, you know, so fast forward. We know there was, you know, I can tell you many, many stories about things that happened to people. And um, a lot of organizations were, you know, these are citizens groups. It's like getting called to the principal's office. You get a letter from the IRS saying, did you register voters? Did you have candidate forms? And they all start saying things like, were we not supposed to do that? We thought that that was okay. We did Just basically having the federal government inquire about what you've done makes you think you've done something wrong. And um, so it really had a chilling effect on um, these organizations and these citizens, and it made it hard for them to raise money, et cetera, et cetera. And most of these are small organizations. These are not gigantic, multi-million dollar groups running TV ads. That's not who they are. That's never who they were. Um, and the idea was to uh, chill their activities, and that's what happened. Um, actually, it was February of 2012 when those letters went out. Because it was the fall, the the cut, and it was so I was one year behind. I spent eleven actually dealing with the IRS on behalf of several clients. 2010, 2011. It was February 12 when I finally said we got to go get somebody to do something. Um, now where are we with the investigation? The you know I had really I will tell you in all honesty I had recommended and urged the House uh, leadership to appoint a select committee at the very beginning of the IRS scandal because I thought they should pool their resources the House should uh, give it all the authority that it needed to be able to get information and so the IRS couldn't hide behind uh, Section 6103 of the statute that supposedly protects the confidentiality of uh, taxpayer information. It only protects the confidentiality of taxpayer information when the IRS doesn't want to leak it to your political enemies, as it did with the uh, National Organization for Marriage 990. But um, I really, you know, but we, they did, the House didn't do that, and so we've had two investigations, and for the most part, they've worked together pretty well. Um, but, um, you know, they've learned a lot. They've learned a lot, which is that Democrats on the Hill, like uh, Carl Levin in the Senate, Sheldon Whitehouse, um, others, uh, Chuck Schumer, there's a whole range of these guys who were constantly beating on the IRS saying, why don't you do something to try to silence these, these groups? Sheldon Whitehouse sent um, uh, a letter to the Justice Department, had a hearing, had a hearing at which he had the Justice Department, Office of Public Integrity, come and testify, and he was beating on them saying, why don't you prosecute these organizations because uh, they are not supposed to be engaged in political activity, which is not true, and why don't you prosecute them? And so we have this follow-up uh, inf information exchange where Lois Lerner sends a database, a database of something like 12,000 organizations <laughs> over to the Justice Department for possible criminal investigation. And in the process of doing so, they send over uh, some of that confidential taxpayer information that um, is illegal for the IRS to release to anybody. And we know that, that the real, so you have all these people, these Democrats and these liberal groups who are pounding on the IRS to try to shut down this citizen activism, and that's what the IRS set about to do. And now here's, you know, like I said, I could talk about this for four hours, I have to stop. But um, <laughs> there is one political appointee in the IRS, one. 
and that is the general counsel, the chief counsel. There is a commissioner who is appointed, but the, his or her term is not coterminous with that of the president. It's a set term that is either five or six years, confirmed by the Senate, the idea being, so it's a political appointee, but it really goes beyond the term of the president. Everybody else in that agency is a civil service employee. Why do we have a civil service? What's the purpose of the civil service? We know the effect of the civil service is that you cannot fire an incompetent employee, but the purpose of the civil service system is to protect them from and to insulate them from political pressure, right? So one would think that when they start receiving all this political pressure from the Democrats in the House and Senate and the President of the United States and all, that they would say, oh, no, no, no. We can't, we're not responding to that because, you know, and we're protected. We're not going to do what the bidding of the politicians. Did they say that? No, they did not. So in my view is just get rid of the civil, just say they're not under the civil service system. If it's not going to do what it was supposed to do, just get rid of it so we could fire them. But actually what I think we should do is repeal the 16th Amendment and get rid of the IRS. But I do, I do. I do not believe, I do not believe this agency can be saved. I think it is corrupt to the core. And I have heard so many stories. The thing that has been the most depressing to me in all of this are the stories that I hear from people all from all over the country, the things that people have written to me and said, this happened to me, they did this to me, they did this to my family, they did this to my business. And you know what? I know they're true. I know it's all true. And no matter how much Congress has said they're going to protect their citizens from the IRS, it isn't happening. So it's a bully of an agency, and it's used as a – it's become a political weapon in the hands of the Democratic Party. They become the enforcement arm of the Democratic Party. And I'm absolutely convinced that they have audited people who've been donors to uh, Romney and Romney Super PAC and other conservative organizations. And I keep saying somebody needs to investigate that, but I haven't been able to see that happen. So, you know, I'm happy to talk about the lawsuits. I now have, I have, I, be, I did have three lawsuits pending against the IRS. I, you know, we kind of settled one, the NOM, National Organization for Marriage case, where the IRS did agree to pay NOM $50,000 for illegally releasing their tax return. Um, but I've got two other cases going against them. One, uh, to try to get the documents related to that rulemaking that the IRS sprung on us on Black Friday last year, these uh, rules that would have silenced permanently um, the uh, Every Citizens Group, et cetera, 501c4 groups. And um, so we filed a FOIA request in December to get all the underlying documents, and they didn't give us anything, so we had to sue them. And um, so we've gotten over 3,000 pages of documents now, all of them blank or completely, almost completely redacted. So the only fact we have learned is that these rules were supposed to have been published by August 31st of last year. We haven't yet gotten to find out why, because all we get are emails that tell who they're, you know, few, who they're to and who they're from, even though they've blacked out some of the names. So we're getting ready to have a fight about that. And True the Vote sued the IRS. Um, we filed suit in May of 2013. We, uh, the government and the individual defendants, Lois Lerner and the others, filed their motions to dismiss. Those were fully briefed last December, and the judge has yet to rule. And we're just getting ready to start pressing the government to proceed with um, discovery while we wait for the judge to rule. And they're going to fight about that. But, you know, I think that the only way we're going to get to the bottom of this ultimately is through the courts and through uh, if we can – if there were a special prosecutor – to be appointed. But Hans and I were just talking about that with uh, the Daily Signal a little while ago. And I think the only way we'd ever get a special prosecutor is if um, the Republicans were to take control of the Senate and decide to make an issue of this, to say we're not going to pass the Department of Justice appropriation bill, we're not going to do this, or this until you appoint a special prosecutor. And really make a big deal about that. You know, bets are all uh, on as to whether we think the Republicans in the Senate would do something that bold. But in, anyway, I will stop and try to answer questions about any of these things because, as I said, I, <laughs> I could spend a lot of time talking about it. So I wanted to just hit some highlights so you know kind of what's going on. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Can I go first? <laughs> 
You know, in addition to delaying exemptions for Tea Party groups, they also went after a number oh. of existing groups, like the Claire Booth Loose Policy Institute 2011. We had a brutal audit, incredibly expensive, time-consuming. We were totally cleared in the end. I, I knew we would be, unless they made something up, because we've, we've been so careful. But the first thing they asked for was our entire donor list. Oh. And they can't have our entire donor list. I had a really good attorney, Bill Olson, and we argued with them, and so they passed that. Well, now what's happened, and you probably know about this, is the states are demanding our donors. Yes. In order for a 501c3 to do business in a state, it's about 38 states. They make us file a registration. They take some money. <laughs> and, you know, different details. I'm, I'm convinced it all goes into the a box on the floor unless they want to go after you. But now both California and, and New, New York, York are mm -hmm. demanding our supporter names, and they say things like, well, the IRS has to keep them confidential, but we don't. And <laughs> I just wonder if you'd comment on And, of course, now we know how they collude and collaborate, so you're thinking, well, California, the attorney general who sends me these letters, is the sister-in-law of the number three at the Department of Justice, who's just leaving now, which is interesting. And so you're thinking, it was in the Post, and I saw that, and I thought, there's got to be a connection there. Well, there's definitely <laughs> the, a connection. The states. It's well, endless. it's, you know, if you want a Californian, the People's Republic of California yeah. and New York. But, um, look, I think that one of the things that I would like to see Congress do very quickly is to repeal the requirement that any exempt organization disclosed to the government, it's donors. It's not a public filing, so there's no transparency issue. And if and just eliminate that. We know that the IRS can't be trusted to keep it confidential, so just get rid of it. What's the, what's the reason? What's the public policy reason for having to tell the government who your donors are? And it's only donors of $5,000 or more, but I, I will tell you, I don't see any public policy reason, and I think that we need to have that fight. That would eliminate this problem. Yes. It would eliminate the problem of, um, at least for exempt organizations, it would eliminate the problem of disclosure of non-public information. We still don't know how it is possible that um, the Coke Industries uh, confidential tax information made its way to Nelson Goolsby when he was the chief economic advisor to the president in the White House and said in a conference call to reporters when they started their attacks against the Koch, started telling about their tax status. That, how do they know that? That's not a public filing. And what happens when you ask the IRS for, you know, tell us, you file a Freedom of Information Act, tell us who did this, who, who released our information, the IRS says, oh, we can't tell you that because whoever did it, the person from within the IRS responsible for the violation of the law that prohibits disclosure, well, that would violate their 6103 rights. That's what they say. That would violate their 6103 the rights. 6103 is the statute that makes it illegal to disclose taxpayer information. Now, we're not asking about any of their tax information. We're just asking for their identity so that we can hold them accountable. And they have hidden, they, the only way you can get the information is to sue them. And even that, it was not easy to try to get to the bottom of what happened. I'm not convinced we ever really got to the bottom of what happened with the NOM tax return, but we got at least some information. But the person responsible for actually giving it to the national, uh, to the human rights campaign, uh, kept pleading the fifth, so we, we couldn't get any information from him. But it's a it's a mess. It is a mess, and that's why I think we have to. I hope that we can get our. Uh, our elected representatives to understand that they need to they need to move to do some things and to change things fundamentally. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. If you would uh, give your name, would you give Jerry your name? Lipson, um, I'm Jerry Lipson with the Alexandria Republican City Committee. Um, given the massive amount of information you say that you have and that you've been able to make available. Uh, would you be willing to speculate as to why the House Republican leadership punted on the question of at least a select committee with subpoena powers, because I assume they could not force the administration to appoint a special prosecutor, since obviously it would not? Well, they, um, you know, the House did pass a resolution calling for the special prosecutor. But, you know, but what are they going to do to enforce that? I mean, you have, there are things you can do. I always say the power that the House has, the power that Congress has, is the purse. And the truth of the matter is the House doesn't have to pass an appropriation bill. They can just sit on it. And at some point, you know, the, somebody has to deal with them. They, why do they do anything? Why do they not do anything? I think the reason that 
The Speaker's office was unwilling to appoint a special committee at the very beginning, which would have passed unanimously if done right at the beginning, is because the Speaker didn't want to choose between two committee chairmen. I mean, in the final analysis, that's where the Speaker's power comes from, which is, is his own members, his own chairman. And, you know, he wasn't going to cash in political capital for this. I think it's a huge mistake strategically, but look, I mean, there... I've been in the House of Representatives, and I happen to know from firsthand experience that what matters most is what's happening inside that chamber and not necessarily what's happening outside that chamber. It's not a criticism. It's just a statement of the way it works. I have a question about uh, the regulations. Where do we stand? Oh. We know that the commissioner is eager, and I know that you're following what the left has been advising and petitioning that he do. Where do we stand and what should we all be looking for um, and what opportunities to make our voice heard in the future uh, would you foresee? Well, when they withdrew the regulations that they had proposed last um, November, the IRS uh, commissioner said immediately thereafter that they were withdrawing these, but that they probably were going to issue some revised regulations next year and have a hearing after that. Look, I mean, I think that... And can you explain what the regulations would do? And what well, oh, gosh, you know, the regulations would have uh, created a new definition called candidate-related political activities, and it would define candidate-related political activities very broadly and include things that are not political activities like nonpartisan voter registration or uh, hosting a candidate forum or a candidate debate. Even having a, uh, a, an elected official come and speak to your organization, even if there's nobody in the room who can vote for that person, that would be deemed a candidate-related political activity. And it would have to count against uh, the political, the primary purpose of the organization. And it was only, these regulations were very burdensome, very oppressive, only, I mean, I could go on and on about the things that were awful about it, but, um, so we had 160,000 comments. You know, we, a lot of us went to bat, a lot, a lot of people in this room really worked hard at getting comments and, 160,000 comments on a federal regulation is a lot. It was certainly like 10 times more than the IRS had ever received on any proposed regulation or all their regulations combined. Let me mention one other thing that I read that Koskinen said. This is why the little toad, I just think he's a little toad. Um, <laughs> this is one of the reasons I think he's a little toad. He says in some interview that, um, that his staff is going to provide for him 70 or 80 of the comments to read. 70 or 80 out of 160,000? I'd really be curious to see what those, that's probably the only ones they got who were in favor of the regulations. So they're going to cherry pick those. That is not somebody who strikes me as someone who's very interested in actually knowing what's going on. And he sat right there in January in his first appearance after his confirmation before the House Ways and Means Committee. He sat right there and, and talked about why, why it was so important to have these regulations. He's been on the job, what, three or four weeks? He knows nothing about this. But he's already spouting the party line. And he, they say that they're going to reissue regulations in early 2015. So I think that we need to have a meeting with Koskinen, with conservatives, to give him, because we know that they've been getting meetings and pressure from the left, which is incessant, always pressuring for more regulation of free speech. And I think that we need to um, see if we can meet with him to give him an alternative view. Whether he'd do that, I don't know. But I think we need to try, and I think we need to do everything we can do to let them know that if they, do, if they come back, we will be back too with a vengeance, and that we're not going to just sit idly by and let them um, you know, suppress our free speech rights. I mean, where is it in the authority of the Internal Revenue Service that they have the right to do that? I don't know where they have come with the right to do that. But trying to understand what it was that they were doing and what the pressures were and where it was coming from, that's why we filed the FOIA um, lawsuit. And, you know, I have big binders of blank pages and blacked out pages. But we're probably going to go to court uh, 
going to ask for a status conference with the judge on that and show the judge this is what we're getting. They say, well, we don't have to tell you that because it's part of the deliberative process, and we don't have to tell you anything about the deliberative process. Well, that means that you could never, ever get any information ever from the federal government about any of the government's thinking or any agency's thinking about any regulation. That, that would be what that would mean. And if that's the truth, then they just need to say that. But there's no blanket exemption for regulatory, you know, regulations. You don't have to provide agency. It, it, the statute doesn't say that you don't provide information or do, documents about regulations. It doesn't say that. But that would be the effect if they are successful. But they are stonewalling. They see their, themselves as being, um, it's their job to shut us up. And I don't think they're going to stop until some judge, probably the Supreme Court, tells them to stop. So January 2015th is... They said early 2015. That's what they said. Hi, Nina Tarenko with the Heritage Foundation. Um, what do you think would happen in a new administration? Would, how would that affect anything going on um, in this area? Depends on which administration it would be. Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll tell you all some. <laughs> I am a conservative before I am a Republican. And I think that one of the things that worries me is that I think one of the reasons that the Republicans have not sewed up the Senate for this year is because I do not think that the American people perceive that there's much difference between Republicans and Democrats. And this is a whole different speech I'll come give another time. Um, and I think that a big challenge for a presidential candidate is, of the Republican Party is going to be that same thing. How, how are you different? You know, how, how, what is your vision of what, the, what America is and should be? And I think that's one of the reasons Romney lost. And so what ends up happening is because you don't have candidates for the, you know, you don't have candidates, you don't have people nationalizing the election saying, here's where our country is headed. You want to look like Europe? You want to look like East Berlin? Because that's where we are headed in terms of loss of liberty, loss of opportunity, loss of freedom. The American people, I think, would respond to that. But we don't do that. You know, the party raises all this money and turns it over to a bunch of consultants who, it doesn't matter if they win or lose, they still make a lot of money and they're back the next year spending the money. Now that is a recipe for disaster, and that's what we do. And I've seen it up close and personal all these years, and you know it's disgusting. And so I think that's one of the reasons you have a situation like we have in Kansas, where you have a guy running as an independent who says he voted for Obama in 2008, he voted for Romney in 2012. He, you know, he likes Paul Ryan, and he knows this about the budget. He knows, you know, so you can't really tell what he is. Well, I don't know who he'd caucus with, but I am telling you, I just saw a poll this week. Gallup has done a poll that shows that the parties are about equal in the attitudes the American people have about them, and they're both about 57, 58 percent negative view. So, and I'll just close with this. So you asked me about a new administration. Which one? I have no idea. If it's Hillary, you think she's going to do anything? If it's, you know, pick one. Maybe. Maybe. But, I, but, you know, these are the questions we ought to be asking. These are the questions we ought to be asking. But I will tell you this. Who knew that the Republicans had the – Republican senators had the fight in them to really make a big fight, to take a stand, to tough guys, we're going to fight to the bitter end no matter what. Did they do that to the Democrats at any time that I can think of? No, but guess what they did? They did that in Mississippi against Chris McDaniel and the Tea Party. <laughs> Who knew they had that much spit and vinegar in them? Yes. Liz Messina with the Susan B. Anthony list. Um, in regards to the donor list that the IRS requested, um, how should, what concerns should the donors have if that were actually to be sent to the IRS? How would, like, what speculations do you have that the IRS would use that against the actual donors? I think that the IRS has used that against actual donors. I think that they have, um, particularly used it against um, donors to Romney and the Romney Super PAC. I've just heard too many, I've just heard too many stories. And, um, you know, they do know who the um, donors are, $5,000 or more to every exempt organization, so they have that. 
there was an analysis done that the House Ways and Means Committee did of, um, you know, I told you that in those development letters that they sent out in February 2012 that they were asking for donors, and a lot of groups gave that information to them because they didn't have Cleta Mitchell saying, we're not giving that to you. Um, and so guess what? So they have this information. The uh, House Ways and Means Committee did an analysis of, you know, so how many of these people were audited. There were ten times more, uh, a greater incidence of audits of those, those donors than the general population. So, you know, can I tell you that you can tell your donors, don't worry? I wouldn't tell my donors that. I just wouldn't bring it up and hope they don't ask. <laughs> yes. Ali Meyer, I'm with CNS News. Um, when you watch the IRS hearings, often you know Republicans come on and they will grill um, the witnesses, but Democrats um, like Cummings and um, Cartwright specifically have said things like that the Republicans are holding hearings for political theater. Um, what is your response to someone that thinks that way? Well, I think the Democrats have been just dreadful in these hearings, and to me, I don't understand why. I think you ought to be able to make a case to the American people if anybody would actually make the case that, you know, do you want uh, do you want these members of Congress who are siding with the bureaucrats, or do you want members of Congress who are trying to find out from what's the bureaucracy been doing and siding with the American people? But I did make a comment when I was testifying um, in February that well, actually this was kind of a funny exchange. So Cartwright. They don't ask questions substantively, and they don't want to know the facts, and they have their little talking points, and they come in and they say their stuff, and then they leave. But, um, and they've done everything they can to try to derail the investigations. Um, and we now know that the Department of Justice and the IRS are both working with the Democrats on the committees to try to undermine the investigations. We know that. Um, but so Cartwright asked me, um, so Ms. Mitchell, do you represent any, I see you are president of the Republican Lawyers Association. I said, yes. He said, and do you represent any Democratic candidates? I said, nope. And he said, and do you represent any liberal organizations? I said, no. I said, you know what, that, that's not how it works. You know, you can't play for Notre Dame and USC, you got to pick. And, you know, I said, so I, I, my clients are Republicans and they're conservative groups. And I see that you served in the legislature in Oklahoma. I presume that was as a Republican. I looked and I said, actually, no, uh, Congressman, I was a Democrat then. And I said, but I decided that the Democrats had become the party of government instead of the party of the people, and I choose to be a part of the party of the people, not the government. And so you had this other Congressman, these other Congressmen. I resent that. Take that. Uh, that. That is not accurate. Jerry Connolly from Virginia. You know, well, that, oh, that's not true. You know, that isn't true. That I, I just said, you know, speaks for itself. But, um, but I think that's true. The Democrats have become the party of government. It's hard to know where the government begins and ends and the government employees unions. You know, all these people who are part of attacking the conservatives, they're members of the National Treasury Employees Union, they give 99% of their money to Democrats. I mean, it's us against them. And you got the, de what used to be was that Congress was supposed to oversee, provide oversight of the executive branch. That's not the way it is anymore. You got the Democrats and they're the defenders of whatever the agencies are doing. And I just think that's wrong. Cleta always makes you want to go out and fight, doesn't she? Well, I love to have her. We have a calendar we do, Great American Conservative Women. It's for young women, college women. It's for everybody. But we have the, these role models. Some of this spoken for us in the last year, and Cleta's in there. And you can see why. She's a wonderful inspiration. Well, you guys are great. Thank, Thank you, you for so all you much. do. Thank we you. Have, we have some little gifts oh, here. Oh, yay. This is our latest version. Oh, that's beautiful. Our limited edition coffee mug, Claire Booth Loose, with her famous saying, no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> <laughs> and for your wedding items, oh, a little thank tote bag. You. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> and from Heritage, we have our brand new revised wow. Guide to the Constitution that has just recently 
uh, been released, I think just in fact last week. Oh, that's uh, wonderful. So we're very pleased to um, present you with this. So many of the Tea Party groups that have been really raked over the coals in all of these investigations were really standing up for the Constitution and the principles of the Constitution, the most basic rule book that they think should be applied equally to everyone without favor, which is what you have been fighting for. So we're so pleased that you were able to join us today. And we'd like to welcome you all for lunch afterwards uh, where we can continue the conversation with Cleva. So thanks again for joining us. Thank you all so much.